Hello um, to our final lecture in the series Basics of Microbolecular Crystallography. Today's lecture will be a little bit shorter, about only half an hour, and we will talk about validation in the PDB. And at the end, I also have a request for you um, with a survey and um, a rather work-related announcement from my group. Um, the topic of validation has grown to me in these last months, because as many of you know, from the email address we are using inside Corona, um, I have been um, leading a project in which we are validating all the structures from the SARS-CoV and SARS-CoV-2 virus. So um, about uh, 550 structures have come out in the PDB since the beginning of SARS research. Um, several hundred of them only in recent months. Uh, many of them have been published on a very high pressure. So it's really quite an achievement that in such so short time people could solve these crystal, mostly crystallographic structures and so find out more about the virus and also help people who design drugs based on the structures to find uh, inhibition sites or to even enable them to design drugs. However, while we were doing this work, we found out about many common errors um, in modeling and several that um, are possibly not so common or have been overlooked up, up until now. And of course, we're not the first one to think about this. Since ever there have been statistical data in the PDB, actually since ever there have been protein structures, people have thought about the statistical properties of structures and what could be considered an error and why. And this is a little bit what this lecture will be about, but it will also be about the great wealth of data you now have at your fingertips that you know how our structure is solved. You're ready to dive into the PDB. So let's see. Um, yes, topic is PDB and validation. The PDB, um, actually the WW, the worldwide PDB has um, three um, members that are interesting for crystallography. The RCSB PDB, which is the American Protein Data Bank, PDBJ, which is the Japanese one, and PDBE, which is the Protein Data Bank in Europe. All three of them hold essentially the same database. So every structure you can find on each of those homepages. However, the statistics they derive and what they look like are a little bit different. And all of them offer some additional services, which is why as a more experienced crystallographer, if you are a few years in the business, you're usually able to use all the different web portals. Um, as of today, there are roughly 170,000 macromolecular structures in the PDB. So these are biological structures, um, RNA, DNA, and most of all proteins, plus whatever was bound to these uh, large biological macromolecules. So you've got to imagine, we know 170,000 structures and they represent a large sizable portion of all the known folds. Um, Many of them have an attached publication. So really, we've come quite a long way since the early days that I described in the first lectures. The structures are deposited by authors. Um, these are typically the people who did solve the structure. So who did the purification, crystallization, measurement, uh, integration, scaling, phasing, and refinement and then got to deposit their structure. The positions can, in hindsight, only be changed by authors. So whatever you find in the PDB is what the authors gave the PDB. And even if the structure is 20 years old, it will not have been changed. In order to get structures that have been revised, but not by the authors, you have to look to individual homepages, such as um, the one by Global Phasing for Corona, for example, or PDB Redo. However, authors can decide to revise their structure. So if you ever deposit a structure for yourself and after a few years you find there was an error in it, you could well 
revise your deposition and change the structure without losing the four letter PDB code. The files available from each of the PDBs are the model file containing the coordinates of the atoms and uh, other useful information. This used to be in PDB format. Now the major format is MMSIF. PDB is still available. Both can be read into programs like PyMol or CRUD, so you can display the model. For EM structures, about which we're not talking in this lecture very much, uh, there is a map as uh, processed experimental data for X-ray uh, diffraction data, you get a merged file. Now, this merged file is not raw data. You don't get the detector images. What you get are um, structure factors, so structure factor amplitudes, or intensities of both merged and scaled. So basically the data set that the um, structural biologist, the depositor, refined against, or at least you hope so. In most cases that's what you get. And then the PDBs also offer you a number of derived data. So for example they give you, um, since rather recently, a readily calculated map, so you don't have to do refinement in order to get a map from the data and the model. Um, derived statistics, um, oops, I'm going to show them in a later slide, the sequence, you can also have an in-browser 3D viewer now, so the PDB, even since the days I was a student, has really become so much more convenient and alone with the web browser you can already look and evaluate a structure. So this is what the Protein Data Bank in Europe looks like because I'm in uh, Germany, I thought I'd show you this, the actual PB people sit at the EBI in Hingston in Britain. Um, this is what it looks like. And uh, you, you would usually search by PDB code, author name or protein name, and then refine your search until you've got what you want. I'm not gonna talk in this lecture about the advanced searches available, but I would really recommend if you are doing a lot of PDB research to familiarize with for example, how to search for a structure that contains um, a better barrel fold and has been solved in 1995, and this was the offer, because you can combine these queries, and that often makes your searching very accurate. I would also recommend that you familiarize with structure overview tables. So for example, you can say, I want to see all anthrax toxin structures, and then you can have a table of all the space groups attached to these entries. And so you can see, oh, um, the poor forming anthrax toxin domain uh, grows in these two space groups, for example. But the question you have to ask yourself looking at the PDB is, how true is that structure? And as you may know by now, after having listened to me and others um, for this well past months, a structure doesn't necessarily need to be completely true. Um, the models are only an interpretation of the measured data. So the model is not the truth. The model is our hypothesis. The experimental truth and the experimental errors are in the data. So if you see a picture of a structure and there is no density visible and you don't have a table one to judge your data quality, that information is to be taken with care. I know that in the last like 20, 20 years, it has become more and more popular to omit density and experimental data completely. They are now often found in the supplemental of a paper. However, that means that people are only presenting you with their hypothesis. So you need to check. There are three areas of checking, of validation. One is the data quality. So how good were the measured data? Do I believe that the quality of these data actually supports the conclusions drawn? It is, for example, obvious that if a paper about a bound metal ligand discusses the distance to the metal atom um, 
in detail. So let's say whether it's 0 0.1 angstrom here or there. But the overall resolution of the data was only three angstrom. The X-ray data would in no way support this with any evidence, and it is pure fiction. This is hopefully also the job of good crystal structure reviewers to criticize whether the data support the conclusions drawn. However, the question can be tricky because even if, even if your data set was a 1.2 angstrom data set, um, the bond length will still be dependent on a correct choice of unit size, a good processing of the data, a good fit of the model to the data, so there are very many factors and judging this is not easy. And because we are automatizing so much, experts are becoming rarer and rarer. So even though this is a lecture in the basics of macromolecular crystallography, I certainly hope that there will be a few future experts among you. The next is the fit between model and data. So for example, if your side chain is not in the density, um, and there is no electron density to support it, its conformation is likely but not supported by the data. Or possibly it's even unlikely and not supported by the data. You need a fit between data and model in order to be sure that your model is actually interpreting the data and not just garbage in, garbage out. The next one is the prior knowledge about molecular geometry. If you are seeing a disulfide bridge in which the two sulfurs are only 0 0.5 angstrom apart, the chemist in you should give you a warning because this clearly is not an ideal bond distance. The same is, of course, true for, for example, phenyl rings, which are not planar, um, things that don't make any sense. We had, pre over the last few lectures, we had quite a lot of like examples of this. So we can use this prior knowledge about the molecular geometry in biological macromolecules to validate our structures. And here is the graphic I was searching for earlier. This is the so-called slider graphics from the PDB. So you get this now with every structure. And there is a metric. Here is the R3, an indicator between, fit, between data and model. And then a percentile ranks. So percentile relative to all X-ray structures and percentile relative to X-ray structures with similar resolution. What we can see here is that if we look at the entire PDB, this structure would be um, approximately in the upper 30% or yeah, let's say 35% of our free values, irrespective of resolution. So with the slider being here, the structure may be really good or not having a catastrophic fit. However, R3 can also be biased, for example, by twinning. So that alone doesn't tell you much. The next one is clash score. If you have two atoms coming close to each other, each of them has a van der Waals radius. And this van der Waals radius actually gives you a minimum distance between the two atoms, right? They, with their electron clouds, they cannot bump into each other very much. They're very strong forces bringing them apart. So if two atomic centers are too close together, that is registered as a clash. And um, a clash score can be calculated for the entire protein. Um, again, of course, blue is good, red is bad. You can see that um, for this structure, the two bars are relatively close to each other and the fit is okay-ish. Ramachandran outliers are torsion angle restraints, so another prior knowledge geometry validation. And here we are relatively bad in comparison to all others. Sidechain outliers, these are the conformation of the sidechain. 
and so on. So this slider gives you an indication. Um, it's very good for a first look. It is not good for an in-depth opinion about the structure. Um, I know it's not very popular, but my recommendation is download the file and look at it. Nothing replaces looking at structures. There is no automatic way to tell whether a structure is good or bad. That is as good as an experienced eye and looking at each residue. And this is very unfortunate because it means a lot of work if you want to look at the structure. Let's start off with data quality. So the most popular of all um, indicators for data quality is of course resolution. Now, in my opinion, resolution is slightly overrated, in particular in an age where we have a standard deviation attached to each intensity. Um, still, people decide to cut their data somewhere and that gives you the resolution. And you may have some debate on whether they should have cut at 1.5 or 1.2 or 2.0, but you'll be sure that that structure is not like a 3.5 angstrom structure. So it gives you an indication of the level of detail and the amount of data that was available to determine the parameters. And of course, the lower the resolution, the better. Um, there's, by the way, a little bit of a language caveat here, because we measure resolution in angstrom. A lower resolution has a higher numerical value. So a four angstrom structure has a lower resolution than a two angstrom structure but a higher number of angstroms. So unless we forget, which I do very often, it is much better to speak about a better and a worse resolution. So 4.0 angstrom resolution is worse than two angstrom resolution. And then it's very clear what I'm speaking about. You'll ever so, it's ever, every here and then you see something like one over angstrom resolution which is basically the same thing, it's just this inverted value or one over angstrom squared. Um, then the diffraction strength. Now, the overall diffraction strength tells you the intensity over the sigma, how well um, could this data set be measured, how strong was the background, uh, were there a lot of errors, in this case the value would be low. If the value is high, it often indicates that the scattering, the detector, the diffraction, everything was good, integration worked, um, high values are wanted. There is also typically a value for the outer shell. So you look at all the data you've measured, and then you can also look at the outer shell. So just before you cut the resolution, you take a thin slice, a thin sphere of data, and you say, we are only going to look at those data. Because clearly, where you cut, the data was weak. And the diffraction strength there used to be the old criterion to determine your resolution cutoff. And there were a number of rules of thumb, but which I'm not going to cite here. They have been discussed previously. And also, I think that's not how you should do it anymore. There is also um, the R merge, which goes by a lot of names. Uh, R sim, R linear, it's very popular with small molecule crystallographies, and it has been uh, very widely used in the, the past to determine the resolution cutoff. So the problem with this is the higher its multiplicity, the higher is its value. So if you have made a measurement where you recorded each reflection twice, and then you have made a measurement where you recorded every reflection four times, the R merge would automatically be higher because it becomes higher with multiplicity. Um, that makes it a rather bad quality indicator. And, um, it can also be lower in some softwares, and you can sometimes not tell what has been used to calculate the value you see in the PDB. For example, if the assumption is that Friedel mates are completely independent, which is an, an assumption that ScalePack is making. Better than our merge, in my opinion, is the RIM, or also called RMIAS, the redundancy independent merging R factor. And that gives um, the precision of individual measurements independent of multiplicity. 
Um, so it shows you for a given reflection that should, if it would have been measured ideally only have one value, um, how broad the distribution of intensity values is. And this is particularly useful to evaluate low resolution data quality, for example, for experimental phasing. Um, one moment, please. Let me drag this one back here. Um, so both our MIAS and our MERGE must be measured before the data. Um, yeah, they measure the uh, uncertainty before the data are merged. Um, oops, sorry. Um, so the next one is exactly the precision of average intensity measurements, our PIM. So the precision indicating merging R factor, that's why it's called PIM, precision indicating merging R factor, describes the precision of average intensity measurements. So after they've been calculated together and gives you the standard error of the mean. So how precisely the center of the distribution is known. It's not how broad the distribution is, but how exactly know, do we know its center? And it also needs to be calculated before data are merged. So you have, once you look at your PDB entry, absolutely no chance to calculate this yourself, um, unless you have the images or the integration data. But usually with what the PDB gives you, there is nothing you can do. Um, here we are. Um, the next one is CC one half. So this is not always given. And it's only interesting for the highest resolution shell and can be used to cut off the data. I would uh, very much uh, recommend you to read the paper if you want to understand it um, in detail. There are a lot of rules of thumb on at which way, at which point to cut. Um, but I think that we possibly need to do a statistical test to find out where to cut the data. However, your favorite reviewer group leader will certainly give you an idea of the value and many people go at around 30% or something. Um, then there is the completeness, which tells you how many of the reflections that could have been measured at this resolution have been measured. And this is given both overall and for the highest resolution shell. And if this value is like say below 70%, I would be very, very. That means something went completely wrong in the measurement and you're not sure if the structure is really good. Now, so much for what the PDB gives you, but you have some other options there. If you really want to know how good the structure is or you want to evaluate your own structure before you deposit it, you can and should put it into a program like Phoenix X Triage or CCP4 Struncate. This will give you information on twinning statistics, whether it's likely that you're having a non uh, a merohedal or pseudomerohedal twin. Translational non-crystallographic symmetry, which also makes a kind of ripple effect on the reflection. So the reflections become systematically higher and lower or more equal. Yeah, and so it depends on what type of NCS or overstructure you have, but um, it makes uh, reflections look too similar or too different. And it also gives you other statistical properties, like for example, Wilson plot fit. Um, oh, I don't know. There we go. Um, then Auspecs, which is the software that my lab is developing. So I'm going to have a, one slide about it. Um, it can help you to find ice rings, bad masking, data conversion problems. Um, what if, which is included in PDB Redo, is very, very old fashioned and not very many people use it, but I like it because it's, um, it's giving you a lot of information. I find it particularly useful to find out if the detector distance and the wavelength were correct which is sometimes not the case. And if you imagine that, I don't know if you, you can do this in your brain, but if you have a detector and you have a crystal and you measure the data set, but then during integration, that detector distance was larger or smaller, your unit cell becomes larger or smaller because the reflections are then farther apart or closer together, which would make your unit cell smaller or larger. 
and this effect will distort every bond length and angle systematically and that's why it can be found in hindsight but it also can give you a lot of problems and errors uh, for example during molecular replacement then there is the pdb peep server which is similar to the star anaiso server by global phasing which gives you a reciprocal space viewer and anisotropy however if you really want to use big brother star anaiso you should rather have unmerged data at your hand but sometimes it can be useful um, here's the slide about Auspex. Auspex is like, by the way, all the others um, are available as a web service or software, very easy to get free for academic use. And each one of those has several papers attached to them, which tell you exactly how to use them. And for the Phoenix things, for sure, there is also a YouTube tutorial. Um, so, um, what Auspex does is it takes um, your data and shows intensity versus resolution um, and makes a dot for each reflection or merge reflection in the data set. So each dot here, would, this is one data set and each dot is one of the reflections. And what you can see is that at one resolution, which would be a circle on a detector image around the beam stop, um, all the reflections are suddenly higher and this happens again and that's because these data have an ice ring so there's a ring on the detector and because the background estimation doesn't cope with this very well all reflections are systematically different now the problem is that your model doesn't assume there are ice rings it's not a part of your model to have ice rings the ice diffraction comes from different crystals ice crystals growing on your crystal so you don't want that um, so it's bad for your refinement and you better do something about it. My recommendation would be get better cryo conditions. Um, but if it happens in a data set you just downloaded from the PDB, it's just a problem to be aware of that may impede, if it's very strong ice rings, the data quality and the model quality. However, we also have learned to cope with stuff like this. So all the algorithms are very robust in dealing with all kind of like bad problems that the data may have. And we also can identify a lot of other things. If you want to know more, look at our homepage, www.auspex.de. Um, we describe all of them there. But I think that this may be an advanced topic, so that's it. The next one is fit between data and model. As we had discussed in the lecture about refinement, there is a number one indicator for the fit between data and model, which is very popular, and that's our work, the residual value or R value, which gives you the difference between the structure factor amplitudes you expect from your model and the ones you have measured, divided by uh, or normalized by um, the observed ones. So it's FOPS minus FCALC device divided by FOPS uh, in average. And um, this value is relatively high for macromolecular structures in the range between 15 and 25% is normal. Small molecules, as I said earlier, are much smaller. Um, then there's the R3 value. So when you did your refinement, when anyone else did their refinement, this is compulsory these days. They took away a few hundred reflections and they refined the data only about against the rest. And then they use these uh, reflections or structure factor amplitudes that they put away to see what to expect from their model to them and how well it fits. This is a kind of semi-independent criterion and therefore is often termed cross-validation. It's technically not quite cross-validation but it's better than no validation and it is a somewhat independent criterion. Um, small differences in our value are to be neglected. The thing is only depending on a few hundred reflections usually and is not uh, valid like in the, in the second uh, after the comma. You, you can forget about it. You need big changes in order to say this is relevant. The difference between those two, the R work and the R three, becomes larger um, the less geometry restraints you have used. So remember the last lecture about refinement where we talked about geometry restraints? The difference between our work and our free can tell you something about this. If it's like heinously large, like over 
I would be very wary. It means that the model has possibly been overfitted against the work set, and that's why the upre ended up being so high. Um, there are also several ways to calculate what the difference should be, and because uh, within the coronavirus structural task force, people could not agree on what's the best way. I'm not citing a way here, but you can find out about this in the literature. And anyway, you should be very, if the difference is very, very small, which means something's been wrong, possibly the two data sets have been messed up, yeah, possibly they have been mixed. Or if it's really large, in which case the data may have, the model may be overfitted against the data. There's also now an R observed value, which is calculated by the PB and um, gives you an indication on whether to believe the other two. It should be similar. Um, if the R observed value is 10 percent points higher than the other two, that possibly means something went really, really wrong. Um, B factors are also a very good indication. So the B factor gives you how much an atom deviates from its central position in each copy inside the unit cell and over the time of the measurement given the data. Now, if you have a ligand, which is not fully occupied next to a side chain, and you look at the side chain, the side chain will have, say, B factors in the range of 20. Um, the ligand has B factors in the range of 100 at full occupancy. That would possibly mean that the ligand is very, very badly established given the experimental data. Given that the ligand is possibly a little bit more wobbly than the side chain, you would expect its B factors to be about 40, 35, but not much higher than that. Otherwise, there's uh, not a good evidence in the map that this is actually there. Um, what is also uh, typically a bad sign is if you calculate the B factor average for your protein structure, and then you calculate the B factor average for all your waters that you've added and the waters come out at a lower or equal value as the protein, that usually means that if quite a large number of your waters are not waters, but some ions that have more electron density. So comparing them usually gives you a clue, while single values really cannot help you so much. So comparison between individual atoms and between groups is very useful. And sometimes people also do a B-factor putty, um, like in a pie mold, which helps them to see which parts of the protein overall have been a little bit more floppy than the others. Um, you can also see which phasing method has been employed. That's sometimes important information, because if it was experimental phasing, that may make the structure more reliable. Um, if molecular replacement was used, it's very interesting to see which structure was employed. In particular, at lower resolution, the model may still carry bias from that structure. And the same goes to the refinement starting model, which now is also given, thank God, in a PV. So you can see what they started from. And um, errors from structures can be carried over. We had, for example, in the task force, a case of um, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which is a the target of the drug remdesivir, among others, and it had an um, out-of-register shift in the C-terminus that was carried from the first SARS structure, 6NUS, all the way until about June to each and every polymerase structure that had been solved, because everyone used that first structure as the starting model, and no one had seen that it had an error, which has to be said, at the time the first structure was solved, they had no chance to have the out of register really well there. The density was not well refined, but later structures could have had map evidence to the contrary. It's just that in the hassle of fighting this pandemic, no one really looked at the C terminus. External evaluation for the fit between data and model. My major recommendation is again, look at the map. You can download the map now very conveniently from the PDB, open it up in code, open the coordinates and have a good long look at it. In particular, at the regions that interest you. 
The same goes, by the way, if you ever come into the position that you have to review a structure as a reviewer for a paper, make them send you the data and the model. And if the journal doesn't give you the data and the model, I would turn down this review because I think every good um, journal these days should be able to give you the experimental data for the structure. Um, because you as a reviewer need to ensure that this is actually, uh, the model is supported by the data. You can look at animal density if the structure has been measured at, um, at a wavelength at which something absorbed, um, but only if the deposition in the PDB contains the real mates. Sometimes they have been merged and then you've got no chance. But this sometimes helps you to establish, um, for example, sulfate and chloride positions, metal positions, ligands that contain barium, stuff like this. You can re-refine the structure yourself, and that's exactly what we did in the task force, by the way, um, to see if um, you can improve it. Um, that's also a very nice way to train, but um, if you have no ex previous experience in refinement, I would recommend to start with an old and perhaps very bad structure so that you'll have some successes. Um, Re-refinement often tells you also something about um, the density. You can expect the R value to be a little bit different, in particular if you're using a different program or different parameters choices, for example, with and without PLS, but it may still give you interesting information. If you don't want to do this manually, you can use the PDB redo server you should also use PDB redo before you do your validation. What they do is within the course of approximately a week, they um, go through all PDB entries from crystallography and re-refine them with the newest methods and also do statistics on them. So when you feed a structure or a PDB code into PDB redo, you get a very thorough report on the re-refinement and the model. And the start of it looks something like this. So you can see our validation metrics, and you can see that the PDB entry here had an R value of 18.7 and then uh, redo refinement went down both in R and R3. Um, the bond length and angle set scores went down a little bit. Uh, Ramachandran a plot appearance. So it says that hacking was a little bit problematic. Hydrogen bond satisfaction became better. Um, Still, if you're using PDB redo, you should also not unquestionably take this structure, but you should look at it as well. So this is not a way to make your data better before deposition without looking at them. It's a way to make your data better before deposition with looking at them. Prior knowledge about molecular geometry. So we have this a lot. Um, you want your data to fit the Ramachandran plot, but not perfectly because actually real data don't do that either particular, if there's a metal bound or there's something other unconventional stuff happening in your structure, having a few PDB, uh, having a few Ramachandran outliers is a normal thing. And I would also always be suspicious of very big structures that have a perfect Ramachandran fit, because that means they have refined the structure in a way that it fit the Ramachandran plot perfectly. And then the Ramachandran plot is useless as a criterion for validation. Uh, we are on the next page going to speak about CABLAM, which is uh, helping you in such cases where the Ramachandran plot is no help anymore. Um, deviation from ideal bond length, uh, bond angles, dihedral angles, and chirality are, of course, also suspicious. However, a little bit of deviation is good because not, there is not, no structure is ideal. Um, and you always may have some chemistry that just isn't covered. Um, Again, you need to look at it and take it apart bond by bond. Um, but I also put this picture here, um, which is, uh, if you may remember from the last lecture from this ligand, and if you are a chemist, this should look very wrong to you. However, none of these checks, of course, would have found a ligand like this. Uh, perhaps bond length, but only if the, whatever you used for checking or whatever the PB used, includes these bonds, which is not always the case. So you can deposit stuff like this. Um, this I'm not going to say which PDB this is from, but this is actually from a deposit structure that can be found in a PDB if you search hard enough. So don't be that guy or that person. Um, deposit nice structures, please. Um, 
external evaluation of geometry fit, um, check your chemistry and coordinates visually. So you want to look at your glycos at glycosylations in the structure. Are the sugars like on the right way? Are they bottom top? Are they the right way around? Are the ligands good? We just had that. Uh, do the ligands, do they fit the density, but also are, is their geometry sound? Is that what you expect? Should this aromatic ring be flat? Um, here is a picture of a ligand which is very sound and is also fitting the density nicely. This is what you want. It's actually an OMID map. So this map has been refined without the ligand and the ligand has been fitted in and you can see that most of it is covered relatively well in density. I think it could be argued whether that thing should possibly go down here, but that's what you want. Oh, and I forgot to write, but this picture is from the Phoenix tutorial on ligand fit fitting. Um, then disulfide bridges and you should actually check everything else. So nothing helps you there. And then you can also let stuff being checked by you by the mole property server. This gives you something called mole property score, which is again expressed as a percentile for this resolution. So how good is the structure in comparison to all other structures available? The Kablam score, which helps you when the Ramachandran plot has failed you at lower resolution. And again, gives you an individual clash score analysis, bond lengths and angles. So it's a really useful tool, in particular in combination with displaying the errors in the structure, or at least the things that are out of the norm, I should say, in code. And then again, what if, uh, which I mentioned earlier, does a geometry analysis as well. This brings me to the end of what I wanted to say about validation and about checking your own work and that of others. Errors are part of this game. So, I would encourage you when you find an error to be kind to the person and being critical of their error. Um, every crystallographer, myself included, have made mistakes. It's because the models and the data don't fit together very well, in my opinion, that errors are really a matter of fact in crystallography. The question is not if you're going to make them, but how much and how severe. And I hope what I told you is going to help you to make fewer such structure, such, such errors, to solve better structures, and also to be able to evaluate other people's structures for your purposes. So in the first lecture, in one of the first slides, I showed this picture of the diffraction experiment where you can see the X-ray tube, slit, crystal, and then the diffraction. And then we have come all the way from making crystals to measuring crystals, integrating and scaling them, phasing them, doing refinement and validating and depositing them to the PDB. Um, we have made a circle in 11 lectures. Um, and I only have some final advice to give, which is, you should become a specialist at what you're doing, in particular in crystallography. Whatever it is you're doing, whether it's molecular replacement or just refining a ligand, you should become a specialist and read as much as you can and talk to everyone and ask a lot of questions. They don't make you sound stupid. They actually make you sound intelligent. Use all the things at your disposal. Um, it's how I myself learned and you can do crystallography without being a specialist, but it's a lot less fun because you don't know what's going on. You're just throwing data into a black box and out comes something that you hope is correct. So you should question your every step and you should work smart. If your first thousand crystallization attempts with the construct haven't worked, it's not time to do another thousand. It's time to go back to your purification and change what you do. So work smart, don't only be very diligent, but also do the smart thing. Try to avoid your own expectation bias, just because you really want to solve the structure, see this detail, find the ligand. That does not necessarily mean that it is that way. And be your own reviewer. So check things as thoroughly as you would if they were someone else's. And lastly, I hope that you're having 
fun doing research because I think that life is way too short not to find interesting what you're doing. Um, for this lecture series, there is a survey. And as you know, I have provided this lecture um, for free. I am not paid to teach. Um, some of the YouTube support for this lecture, all the Zoom support has been done by Constantine, um, who has been a great help and has been funded by the um, German Federal Ministry of Research and Education. Um, but the one thing that I would ask of you is to fill in the survey because this is actually going to help us to make the next lectures better. And the more of you are going to fill this out, the better. And um, lastly, I'm looking for a PhD student who is interested in methods. Um, the PhD thesis is about finding out why our R values are so high. Um, and to find out whether there is something we can do different in modeling to improve all the 170,000 structures we've solved so far and possibly a few in the future. Um, you may have seen that the email address I have inside corona at universburg.de is at Würzburg in Bavaria, but I'm going to change as of next month to the University of Hamburg. So um, while this link shows you the details of the position as it is, it will be based in Hamburg. And uh, it's a full-time position for 36 months with funding by the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and the Federal Ministry of Research and Education. And I think it's a very nice project. So if you're interested, please write me an email. I'm very happy to write Skype or send you more information about this. And um, well, if you want to know more, just let me know. That's it from my side. Um, I am finished with this lecture series and uh, I, I'm wondering if you have any questions. So in this case, if there are no um, questions, um, I would uh, possibly ask you again to um, fill out the survey and um, perhaps I see you again. <laughs>